talk about an observation instrument that we developed and that we use in our school. So I'm going to talk about how did we make it, um, how we link that to our development program, some of the problems that we have in our centre, and then maybe some of the more systemic problems that exist with observations. So, um, last November there was a QQI event up in Crow Park, and there was a lady from Turkey, and I hope I'm getting this right, it's Tijen Askit, and she was talking about like part of your quality assurance is that you've got to try and assess teaching and learning. So you've got to know, is it working, is it not? And so when she was talking about observations, she recommended using criterion reference observations. And in her centre, it was a university setting, they were using Bali, which was kind of the, the standard for them. So that's great and that's really nice, but that's not really going to work for me working in a, gen, a mainly general English centre in Dublin. So nice idea, but maybe not going to work for me. So we decided, okay, we like this idea, criterion reference, what will we use? So we decided, well, why don't we just the delta ones because that's a pretty good standard, you know, and it's externally validated. We don't have to think about it too much. But <coughs> that was a little bit high for where our teachers were practicing because we had one delta qualified teacher and she left us high early. And, <laughs> <laughs> and now we have another one who has just passed through the module two. So it's a little bit kind of beyond that level of practice. And so what we kind of figured out was that we have a certain TESOL in our centre. That's good, isn't it? And Peter had kind of done all the work. Peter Lehiff is our CERT TESOL coordinator. And he'd done all the work and made some lovely Trinity certified. So they sent over to Trinity. They said, these are great. So why don't we use them for a start? So that's where we started. We said, OK. We train teachers in our centre and we train them with the philosophy of the school, so we think this is how we would like people to teach. So let's use those descriptors to kind of assess what's happening with our teachers that we have at the moment. So that's how we made it. Yeah, that's how we made it. So here's what you need if you, need, if you want to make your own descriptors. You're going to need some sort of external standard. I think that's really important as a baseline. I did sit in a room maybe about three years ago with three other academic managers in my centre where we made a list of what we think good teaching is. And I don't know, I don't, I don't think that really worked. It wasn't validated from anywhere else, it was just my personal feelings, your personal feelings. I kind of think you need to benchmark it against something um, and then it can evolve. I think you need to have a link between those descriptors and what your practice is or what you would like your practice to be. So again, thinking about uh, one of the most powerful questions you can ask is, if I do something, what effect is that going to have on the classrooms? What's that classroom going to look like? What does that teaching look like when it's finished? We did toy with the idea of, well, let's scale it. Let's have you know newly qualified teachers on the CERT TESOL one. Let's maybe change that and go up to maybe a Delta standard later on. But again, we're kind of operating there on the principle that, oh, you've got three years experience. You must have developed all the time. But as we know, experience doesn't always equal development. And so again, not really having a, a Delta standard teaching force I don't think that's really realistic to use those. And um, so the next thing we did was we trialed it. So we made it. We said, great, that's lovely. Um, but we trialed it. We decided, OK, we'll take some of our experienced teachers. We'll go in. We'll use it with them. We'll get some feedback from them. How do they feel about it? Is it working for them? Is it helping them to identify things that they can use or problems that they're having in their classes? We have two centers. So we've one here in Dublin, one in London. So we trialed it in both contexts. Um, and we had, I went to London, I used it there, somebody from London came to Dublin, we used it with our teachers. So that was interesting to try and see, can it work in both places, yes? Um, so here's how we use it. This is what it looks like. So it's just a little sheet, you've got kind of 
different aspects of teaching. They're further subdivided. There's kind of three sets of criteria for each of them. Kind of like at the amazing, wonderful, aren't you and a brilliant teacher at the, you're doing all right. And then at the, mm, yeah, maybe let's do a bit of work on this. So you've kind of got three things. So we use it in a kind of a seven step process. I only realized it was seven when I counted them when writing the slides. So the first thing is, well, tell the teacher that you're going to observe them. You know, let them know. And so what we do is we'll say, hey, we want to observe you in the next couple of weeks. What day is good? We think that's fair enough. You know, the teacher needs to have a bit of control over when you're going to come in and disturb their classes. And the teacher submits a plan. We just use the regular lesson plan format. I know we did previously have, you know, the special lesson plan for the observation, <laughs> which, you know, I don't really see the point of that. It's just more work. Um, so they'll submit their normal plan, so they, you say, this is what I'm going to do. A pre-observation meeting, and again, we use like a little interview schedule with that, kind of some questions to ask about, you know, what are you going to do in the lesson? Why did you choose these materials? Why is this good for these learners? What have they done before? What are they going to do next? Then there's the observation itself. And so during the observation, we try and fill this in as we go, but we also try to keep a running commentary. So I, I, when I'm observing, I like to use my computer, so you kind of hear the tapping. The tapping is constant, mm -hmm. which I find is good, because it doesn't mean, you know, the teacher says something, and then it's... <laughs> <laughs> if you keep it kind of nice, even stream of things going on, there's, there's less kind of panic, you can, and you can hide behind the screen, which I think is good. <laughs> um, afterwards, we'll, we'll write the report, so we have this, we have the kind of blow by blow what happened, and then we have a little report that kind of says, this is a summary of the lesson, this is what happened, this is what it looked like, and then maybe one or two recommendations. There's a post-observation meeting, but it's not straight away, tell me what you're going to do next. It's, here's all the documents. Here's what I wrote, here's the timeline, here's the little report, take that home. Read it, think about it. Decide if there's something that you want to add. So there's a bit of negotiation there, and you can say, oh no, I did that because, and so now, now that can be included in the report. And then finally there's a little conversation about, okay, what are you going to do? So this is where it gets interesting because I might have an idea of, I know what you need to do, and the teacher might come back with, this is what I want to do. And so it's that negotiation between the two of us. So, this is what comes next. So here's my, my lovely picture. So, when, when we're observing, we go in and do this, but that just gives us one kind of idea. So I've seen that one lesson, yeah? But that doesn't really tell me what's really going on with that teacher. So I need, I need a bigger picture. So we use things like process-based feedback, so like asking students, what's it like in this class when the teacher does grammar? What's it like in this class when the teacher does listening? And, and students are pretty good. So we have 15 students in the class. So every class is observed by 15 people. And those students are normally reasonably experienced. They've been in lots of classes. You know, they've seen lots of teachers. So they've got some pretty good ideas on you know, how things work. They might not be able to tell you, oh yes, well, they used an inductive approach. And it, was, it was quite, you know, test, teach, test at, at the start. They're not going to be able to say that, but they'll definitely be able to tell you, well, first we tried the exercise and afterwards the teacher explained. And that's enough for you to be able to say, oh yeah, I know what the teacher was trying to do there. And maybe looking at the lesson plans, maybe from conversations you have with the teacher or conversations you've overheard as you slowly pass by the teacher's room on oh, Tuesday morning. Or just your instincts about you know what kind of teacher is that person. I kind of feel like we've got 38 teachers. I, I think I have a pretty decent idea of what most of them are like as teachers. You get a kind of feel for that with the people you're working with. Okay, so. This kind of full picture, when you have it, helps you to say, okay, I've got a really clear idea of what this person needs to develop. So the observation is just one part. It can't be the whole thing. So now I've got an idea. This is what they need to do. I need to think, is that realistic for this teacher at this moment in time? Because they might come back and they might go, yes, I want to develop 
an action research project on how to motivate C1 students, and you're kind of going, yeah, but I don't know if you're quite there. So it's trying to maybe bring that down a bit or push it a bit higher. And then also you need to think about how you can structure that. Um, so you shouldn't necessarily be telling them what to do, but you need to maybe put a shape on it. Deadlines are important. So enough preaching and here's some of the things. So some of the problems we had. We have maybe four of us in our center that do the observations and that can be variable. We did standardize, so like two people in one class observing and we did a couple with videos as well. But it's still a bit variable and it's still a bit what I like versus what he likes and that leads to inconsistent messaging and that's not really that good. And the instrument works really, really well for people who came through our training course and work with us now. Not so much for people who trained in other centers because maybe they've learned a different style and so do we want them to change to be more like our style or do we accept that there's lots of different ways that work and that's a really interesting question that's probably a longer talk um, in an observation it's just it's just one little slice and it's a really interesting question as well can you tell if learning has happened or is happening in that observation and isn't the whole point to know whether that teacher is effective in making learning happen um, and then the classic of course for us is that the teachers development desires not quite matching maybe their development needs. So those are some, are some of the problems we had. If anyone has any, any solutions, I would be delighted to hear. Um, and then there's some problems that everybody has. So most schools have an observation system, and it's all different ways to do it. Um, but we're really, really bad at observing. So the, the Sutton Trust did some research um, and a report on the MET project, which was done by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and they said it's about 50%. <coughs> yeah, it's a, you may as well flip a coin to decide if it's good teaching or bad teaching. <laughs> which is really, really serious. So like, there's a blog by a guy called Robert Coe, and he was kind of saying it's all about our instincts. So we bring all our biases, our preconceptions, into the classroom with us, and if I went in and observed the class, and then you went and observed the same class later, if that were possible somehow, maybe by video, we would probably disagree. So we're really, really awful at it. Which kind of throws into question a lot of things because insert T salt delta, dip T salt delta, one of the main ways we measure good teaching is through observation. So the question I have is, why aren't we talking about that? <laughs> So is this going to be another thing in 20 years where we're kind of going, okay, it's like learning styles all over again, where we know it's bad practice, but everybody still includes it? You know, look how long what Cambridge took learning styles out of the syllabus maybe a year ago, two years ago? And it's, you know, and yeah, yeah, okay. So really, really recently. So if this research is coming out now that we're not very good at observing, Surely we should be talking about the implications of that on all our major qualifications, um, which is kind of a big, a bigger thing than we can fit into a small bit of tent talk. Yes. <laughs> um, so here's an alternative. I really believe in process-based student feedback. I mentioned that before. Asking them, what do you do in this class? And let's make our judgments based on that. Um, I do think that the likes of Ruth Weiner and Thomas Farrell had great ideas when they said we should use evidence-based so we can count things. We can say how many times a teacher does this, how many times a teacher does that, how many times students do this or that. And then we can decide, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Because we can link it to the outcome of the lesson, we can link it to how effective it is. And then things like guided reflection tasks based on that, so we can ask questions. And there is the danger, of course, of reflecting for what you want to hear, which we heard about a little bit earlier.